This morning, we're going to kind of continue through what Dr. Reggie is, is going through in the book of Philippians. We're in Philippians chapter 3. We're going to go through verses 1 through 9. Um, in your order of service, you'll see that I didn't give them a title and because I'm not great at titles. Because if, if I was giving this morning a title, it would be um, that we have joy instead of rules. We have joy because we have salvation through, I've got Jesus. I don't need anything else. We've got Salvation through Jesus, we don't need anything else on top of that. And so this morning as we look through this uh, passage together, uh, I want to talk to you first about the idea of joy. So let's look first, ready? <clears throat> Philippians chapter 3, we're just going to kind of take it a little chunk at a time this morning. Starting in verse 1, says this, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. When Paul says to rejoice in the Lord, he's talking about joy. Philippians is a book that really talks a whole lot about joy. Now, Paul is writing from a prison cell, um, which is an amazing thing that he's writing from prison and talking about joy. Uh, but even on top of that, he's talking to the church in Philippi, and he's, he's, he's thanking them for lots of things. They've given him a gift, and there's lots of things he's thanking them for. But he's also doing some, some time of correction in the book of Philippi, Philippians to the church of Philippi because he's telling them, like, hey, you don't need these things, or you do need to start doing some of these things, and, and we've got to correct this so that you and I would have joy. And he starts this chapter by saying rejoice in the Lord because you and I have joy that comes from the Lord. Joy has been defined as an internal stability in spite of external circumstances. You and I have that internal stability because of the Spirit of God that lives inside of us. That's what gives us. God is the one. The Lord is the one. We rejoice in him because he's the one that gives us that internal stability in spite of our external circumstances. Joy also comes from seeing a bigger picture. Our external circumstances at best are temporary. Whereas joy in the Lord, when we have salvation, that is eternal. So at best... Our worst circumstances are temporary. And we can have joy knowing that our eternity is secure with God in heaven for absolutely forever. Philippians chapter 3, verse 2. He gets there, but then he starts giving these instructions. You ready? He says, look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. Now, Dogs at this time is, is not the, the lovable, you know, golden doodle that I have at my house that aggressively wants to be your friend. Here, in this time, dogs would be something that would be unclean. They would not be looked upon well. And he's telling them to watch out for the... If it were me, I would replace the word dogs. If I were the one writing this, I would replace it with older sister. <clears throat> or, or, or maybe like older sibling or something like, if you have older siblings, you know, I have one older sister, um, her name is Holly, um, and if you've ever played a game with an older sibling, you can know exactly what Paul is writing about in the next few verses. We, the house that I grew up in, we, we, we had our, our living room, um, and then we had a dining room, kind of all one, one space there, and it was, you know, separated by the plum-colored floral couch that we had that was very 1992. Um, but between the back of the couch and the dining room table, there was this little space that was there uh, where my sister and I would play a lot of games. One of our games that we would play, we would call Rubber Band Wars. It sounds exactly like, like it is. We each would have like a, a, a large handful of rubber bands. Uh, we would take our bean bags that we had been given for Christmas one year. She would set up on one side of the room and I would set up on the other and we would just try to shoot each other with rubber bands. Um, it was great, awesome fun because I was smaller than my sister um, and um, I think smarter than her. Um, and so she would hide behind her bean bag and have her rubber band and just would pop up and shoot it. And then pop up and, she, and then load it, get another, pop up. And there was this rhythm to the way that she would do that. Um, she was highly inaccurate because she didn't look where she was shooting. Um, and so I would just kind of be behind my little bean bag and I'd just wait and time it and just shoot her right in the face as soon as she would pop up. <clears throat> um, because that's what would pop up above the bean bag. And so she, being the older sibling, would then have to make rules, right? She'd go, all right, look, you can't shoot people in the face. Like, 
that's the only part of you that I can actually, okay, whatever, that's fine, you know, we'll, we'll continue here. Um, because she was a little bigger than me, um, she would have like, you know, her leg or foot would stick, couldn't quite tuck it in behind her bean bag. I'm like, all right, can't shoot you in the face, so here we go. And then, I'll, well, that's not fair because you're smaller than me and you fit behind her, so you can't shoot the parts of me that are sticking out of the, I can't shoot you in the face and I can't shoot you like, all right, whatever, like, okay, we can figure something else out. So she, and again, she's just not looking at all while she's doing this. And so I would sneak around behind the, the dining room table. She has no idea. She's still shooting my beanbag. And I would get over to the side and then just, you know, kind of unload from the side, and, you know, to, to get her. She's like, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. You can't leave your beanbag. Like, why are you inventing all of these rules? You're inventing the rules because I'm winning and you're losing and you can't handle that. But like, uh, all right, fine, I can't, like, can't go around. So I would take then, I'd just sit behind my beanbag and I'd just grab a handful of rubber bands and just throw them up in the air and it would rain rubber bands down and be like, all right, well, I definitely got you there. And she's like, well, you can't throw them. I'm, like, I'm done, I don't wanna play anymore. Your rules have, have been too much. I do not want to play games with you anymore. And so I would, would go and I'd just, you know, have my own little, you know, I don't know, do something by myself. I'm sitting there minding my own business on my beanbag, unbeknownst to me that not only has she changed the rules, but now she's changed the game. She snuck around on the other side of the plum flowery couch, jumped up on top of the couch on the back, perched like macho man Randy Savage on top of the ropes. And she then jumps and in the air, she says, let's wrestle. <sighs> jumps on top of me, and it was the first time in my life that I remember um, experiencing this, the, the, the joy of having the breath knocked out of you, where you can't breathe in or out, and you don't really know what's going on, and your sister panics because she thinks she's killed you, and like, it's an amazing time for everyone, right? And she's completely changed everything. But she won. <clears throat> she definitely won, right? Here, Paul is dealing with a group called the Judaizers, they're coming in behind Paul as he goes on his journeys and as he preaches the gospel. And they're telling new Christians and even Christians that have been there for a little while, he's saying, look, I understand that Paul is telling that you're saved by faith in Jesus Christ alone. But what you really need to know is you're not only saved that way, but you also need to follow more rules. You need to be circumcised and you need to do these things and we need to worship this way and we have to do, and they're adding rules to salvation. And Paul here is addressing that. He's saying, look, this, this is not the deal. It's, it's, it, you're changing what salvation really is. You're changing the whole thing. That's not what it's about. It's not about these rules. It's not about doing these things. You're going through these ceremonies or these symbols. or the, the, It's not outward action. It's about what God does in our lives. That's it. Philippians 3.3 3 says this. It's where we are the circumcision, who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. He's saying like, there's nothing about what we're doing outwardly, it's about what we're doing inwardly. It's about the spirit of God that lives inside of us. It's not about what we're doing on the outside. Salvation is not dependent upon our actions. It's dependent upon what God has done. You and I don't require and there's even nothing that we could ever do to deserve salvation. On top of that, we can't do anything to earn salvation. It is only about what God has done. And you and I simply put our faith in what God has done. That's where our salvation comes from. Verse four, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. That's a bold statement that Paul writes, that according to the law, that he would be blameless. 
What he's saying is, look, these people that are coming in behind me and telling you that you have to follow the law on top of faith in Jesus Christ in order to have salvation. Like, look, if that was the game, if that's what we're doing here, like, I would be the MVP of that game too. But that's not what we're doing. It's not about those things. It is not about these these personal uh, conquests. It's not about, like, that I've done something, that I have achieved anything. None of that matters. I have a shadow box uh, that's currently in a closet in my house collecting dust. Uh, But my mom graciously made that for me while I was in college, and it was a wonderful thing that I just can't seem to get rid of. Uh, The the back of the shadow box is actually a piece of carpet um, from the gym floor that I played. That's right, I played basketball on carpet. Um, And they redid that, and she saved a piece of the carpet for me and made me my shadow box. Uh, But on top of that, I have different little trophies and medals and different things from junior high and high school. It's uh, basketball tournaments, and it's a a piano recital, which that was, uh, lost most of that. Um, I've got tennis trophies, and I've got different things, and and math, all kinds of stuff. Even in all of those things that really nobody cares about anymore, because who cares what I did in in middle school? The one that kind of sticks out to me that's in there that's different than the rest, I actually won a trophy at a church camp once. When I was 16, just after I turned 16 years old, they gave a trophy out for the most Christ-like camper. I won. Now, the interesting thing about that is, It was at that camp on the last night of camp that I actually became a Christian. For a whole week of camp, I looked a lot like a Christian, but I wasn't one. My dad's a pastor. I've grown up in church. I've done church all of my life. I've known stories, and I've known facts from Scripture, and I've known Scripture, and I've, 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 there's no, I don't know. Uh, There are lots of things inside my head about the Bible and about church. But all of those things do not equate to salvation. Knowing things does not mean that I know God. It is different to have a relationship rather than to just have knowledge. What is required of us is relationship through faith in Christ, not to just know things or look really good on the outside. And at that camp, I either tricked a whole lot of people for almost a whole week, or the campers there really needed a whole lot of help, right? You and I can look really, really good on the outside. We can trick other people into thinking that we are Christians, that we follow Christ, that we are doing the right things. I think there are even some of us who may have even tricked ourselves into thinking that we are good enough to have a relationship with God. But being good enough, Paul's reminding us, that's not what it's about. It's not about following rules. It's not about knowing enough things. It's about knowing God. That's it and nothing else on top of it. Chapter 7, verse 7. Paul continues. He says this. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Again, Paul is saying all of the accomplishments that I've just listed, all the things that would make me stand out and look really good, all that is rubbish. It's loss. Isaiah Chapter 64, verse 6 is the verse that reminds us that our righteousness is like filthy rags. That there is nothing that you and I will ever do that will make us deserve something from God. That we would earn something from God. That we would even impress God. We are unable to do that. The only thing that matters is real relationship with Him. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, those verses 
By grace you've been saved through faith and not of your own doing, lest anyone should boast, right? This, this idea that it is, it is through God and through our faith in him and nothing else. All that's required is for us to know Jesus as our Savior. I love the American dream. I love that I live in America. Because there's something about the idea that you can work hard enough and do enough that you can better yourself and that you can do something good for yourself and for your family and for your future and for the future of your family. I love that I live in a nation where we are free enough to do that. But salvation does not work that way. We cannot do enough. We cannot be enough. But I think that we've bought into this, this idea still. The American Worldview Inventory. It's a survey done in 2020. Found that 48% of Americans believe that if a person is good enough, they would earn acceptance into heaven. So almost half of Americans would believe that if you're just, if you're just good enough, you would get to heaven. From the same survey, said only 35% of Americans believe that salvation comes through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. More people believe if you're good enough, you'll get to heaven. Than believe that Jesus is the way to heaven. Here in the United States. There's confusion there, right? But I think the confusion there may be a little bit our own fault. Barna did research. They said this. They said Americans are confused because even the Christian church is sending mixed messages. Here's what they found. Ready? Barna in 2020 found that 52% of people identifying as Christians, this is over half of people who call themselves Christians, believe in a works-based approach for a person to be accepted by God. Even inside the church, over half, maybe would think that, yes, Jesus, that's a part of it, but yes, also, I need to be good enough. I need to do enough. And if the church is sending that message to the world around us, then I'm kind of surprised that some of those statistics and some of those numbers are not worse than they are. I think and I believe that there are people that come to church all the time that believe that they have the way to heaven because they go to church. Because they're morally better than most of the people around them. Because they are giving or because they are doing or because they go on a mission trip. I think that there are teenagers that I see on a weekly basis that know all about God but have never really made that that decision. They've never really put their faith in him. They've never really started a real relationship with him because right now, because of their actions and because of what they see and because of what they even hear sometimes, that they believe that they are good enough as they are. And they don't need anything else. And this message that Paul is giving here is so relevant for exactly where you and I are and exactly where you and I live. Verse 8 again. Let's read 8 and 9. Verse 8 says, Indeed, I count everything as a loss, because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Again, not knowing about Christ Jesus my Lord, but of knowing him. For his sake I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. 
Paul says everything that he could do on his own, so he counts it as rubbish, which is really just a fancy word and really a, probably a better, I don't know, interpretation of that is really horse manure. Rubbish is, is nice. And he says, everything that I would have done, me being blameless according to the law, is worthless and repulsive when it comes to gaining salvation. It's done nothing for me. I count this as loss. You remember all these things that Paul has said, I've done this and I've been that and I've done these things and I'm blameless. You know that all those things were before he was a Christian. All that was before his whole experience with Jesus Christ and being converted to, to following him. All that doesn't matter. Whatever list of accomplishments that you have in your life, whatever you would be super proud of that you have done, it may be worth something to the people around you. But as far as gaining salvation, it's worthless. It's nothing. I'm not one who would tell you, though, that what we do is meaningless. I think we still go and we do good things. I think we should do good things. You've heard our pastor tell you that, that Christians should be the best members of society. But I don't think that's in order to gain salvation. I think that's a response to our salvation. That's on the backside of our salvation. That because of what God has done, because of the grace and the mercy that he's shown us, then we show grace and mercy to others. Because of the forgiveness that he gives us, that we would forgive other people. Because of the unconditional love that he gives us, that we would love those around us. But that's all response to our salvation, not in order to gain salvation. I want to close with this. Romans chapter 5. I want to read to you verses 8 through 11. It says, but God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Again, just a reminder. While we are at our worst, in the middle of our filth, God would say, I love you enough to send my one and only son who has lived perfectly to die for you and to be resurrected so that you could have salvation. He was not waiting for us to be good enough. Verse 9, since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Again, that closing, we now rejoice because of Jesus. Paul starts this chapter with rejoice in the Lord because that's where our joy comes from, because that's where salvation comes from. Here, it's we've been saved, not because of who we are, but while we're still sinners in the middle of all of our stuff, he, God comes and he's the one who does this. It's not ours, it's, it's what he does. Our salvation is because of Christ and we rejoice in Jesus Christ. I'm glad that there is not a list of things that I have to do in order to earn my salvation. Because I'm very afraid that somebody would come along and say, no, 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 let's change the rules now. Now you have to do this. And you've got, we've got to add this on there. What makes Christianity unique in the world that you and I live in is the idea that you and I are saved because of what God has done. Every other major world religion has a list. You have to do these things in order to get to God or to get to whatever their version of heaven would be or you, you follow these things so that you can... Christianity is the one who comes in and says it's not what you have to do. It's what God has already done. Do you know him? Again, not do you know about him. But do you know him? 
I spent a, a, a large part of my growing up thinking that I was a Christian because I knew what it meant to be a Christian. I could have walked you through a plan of salvation. But knowing those things does not matter. Do you know him? If I tell you facts about George Washington, I've been to his house in Mount Vernon. I know that he was the first president. He's on a quarter. He's on a dollar bill. He was a big um, agriculture guy. In fact, he didn't believe in buying seeds. He said, look, if you've already planted something, buy seeds once and then save the seeds from what you just harvested. Like, well, why would you buy seeds again? Like, that's not smart. He was big in agriculture type stuff. Lots of different things. He was, he was a tall guy for the time, but if you go to his house, like my head would hit all the door frames. And I can tell you things about George Washington, but if I tell you that I know George Washington, now I need to you know, seek professional help, right? Because it's different. It's the same of me telling you that I know about Jesus or that I know him. You and I need to know him. We need real relationship with him. God has gifted us that relationship. Our job is to accept it by putting our faith in him. That's it. That's all. It's simple. It's not too simple. We do not need to add anything else. You do not need to come to church. You do not need to give your tithes and offering. You do not need to go on a mission trip. You do not need to teach Sunday school. You don't need to tell other people about Jesus. You do not need to do anything else. Again, all of those things we should do out of response to our salvation, not in order to get it. So my question for you, for all of us this morning, do you know Jesus? Or are you just going through motions? If 52% of the church believes that our actions have something to do with our salvation, it would be hard for me to think that there's someone here that hasn't believed that lie. And I want to tell you from God's word, all you need is Jesus. But you need Jesus. When much of the world would tell you that it's narrow-minded to think that Jesus is the only way to salvation, it's not at all. In fact, Jesus would accept everyone as they are, still sinners, and give the gift of salvation freely. We do not have to earn it. Do you know it? Have you spent a long time just going through emotions and playing a game? Or do you know him? This morning, we want to give you a time to respond. I'll be down here at the front if you'd like to make a public decision. If you're here this morning and you have said that, um, that you have lived your life knowing about God, but this morning you're like, no, I, I need not to just know about him, I need to know him. I need to put my faith in him. I'd welcome you. I'd love to pray with you about that. If maybe you need to follow up, I know Jesus Christ, but I, I need to be baptized or, I, or something along those lines and let people know that, that I not just know about him. I'm not just going through these motions, but like I really do belong to him. I'd love to talk to you about that. If you want to join in on a church that's doing amazing things and that God is doing amazing things in and through us. We'd love to talk with you about that. Whatever your response is this morning, we'd invite you to do that. Maybe it's just for you and I to join together in praying for our nation, for the people around us, that they would understand the true gospel and what's really required for salvation. Maybe it's a challenge this morning to go and to tell someone, I want to tell you about the free gift of God of salvation that is so simple and so plain and that you need. Let's pray together. Father God, we love you. We love you because you first loved us. We love you because while we were still sinners, you came, you died for us. We love you because you have made it so simple 
to have salvation, to be saved. So God, I pray that this morning, if there's someone here in the gathering, on television, God, within the, the, the sound of your word, that does not know you. Maybe they know about you, but they just, they don't really have real relationship with you. God, I pray that you would bother them with the need for that. God, it is not a need to be enough or to do enough. It's a need for you to work in our lives and for us to put our faith in you. So God, bother us with that need. God, challenge us. God, to, to, to go and to share the true gospel with the world around us. That what they need is you and nothing else. God, bless this time we have together. God, may we do exactly what you are calling us to do during this time. It's in Jesus' name that we pray.